Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. Internal conflicts, foreign wars, helped to break down the feudal order. Terrified of anarchy and sick of it, people turned to new images of stability, the central authority of the crown, the organized state, and a new era of organized violence began. The national monarchies, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. Last time we ended with St. Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic theologian of the 13th century, who argued that all men, Christian and pagan, basked in the light of God's reason and were all part of the same community. But a disciple of Aquinas, a Florentine, known by the name of Dante, was going to take this one step further. For Dante, who was profoundly Catholic, the ideal unity under God was not the church, but humanity. And of this, the Roman Empire was the predestined servant and instrument. In Dante's eyes, the state had a providential mission toward the human race, a mission that was the same in the natural order as the mission of the church was in the spiritual order. This exaltation of the state was almost unique in medieval literature, but it was significant because it looked forward to the Renaissance, to the national monarchies, and to the new humanist culture that would supplant the old order of the Middle Ages. Dante, who lived from 1265 to 1321, was a genius. He was a great poet whose greatest work was a long poem called The Divine Comedy. He was a great dreamer, profoundly affected both by Christian tradition and by the Latin classics. But he was also a typical Florentine bourgeois, deeply involved in local politics and profoundly hostile to the Pope. He spent much of his life as a political exile and as a critic of much that he saw around him. It's sometimes difficult to remember that the rise of the middle class, which Dante in this case represented, the rise of the middle class introduced a factor of great instability in a previously stable society. The activities and claims of the middle classes reverberated at all levels of society, rendering the aristocracy insecure, turning city governments upside down, setting the peasants on the move, even permitting the large-scale wars of the period, especially the Hundred Years' War, by finding new ways to finance them. By the 15th century, the old order was in a state of liquidation and the problem was how to keep society afloat. Every great medieval institution had gone under or was going under. Feudal chivalry was falling before archers and infantry. Feudal castles were falling to gunpowder and artillery. 
the massive monuments of the feudal age were crumbling, the Holy Roman Empire became a federation of German states with the emperor as its president, The Pope's exile to their palace in Avignon functioned as echoes of the French King's will. And then when they returned to Rome, the papacy was torn by factions supporting rival popes. This great schism, as it was called, lasted another 40 years. From 1378 to 1417, as many as three popes at one time contended for the support and the contributions of the faithful, and the papacy lost much of its prestige. As industry and commerce grew, they undermined the social system which was based on landhold. The rising middle classes and the rising cities sapped the power of the feudal barons. Rent was being substituted for service, and the serfs were being emancipated so that the land could be sold for money, or so that their manpower could be used in other enterprises. And all of this broke down the old self-sufficient manorial system. Everywhere there was change, everywhere there was disorder, everywhere the old ways were being challenged or replaced by new ones. And this universal welter seemed to carry a menace of anarchy. That was what people were most afraid of. No clear social or moral order. Just a struggle for power with no holds barred. A situation in which, as Shakespeare describes it in Troilus and Cressida, there would be no justice and no right or wrong. Force would be right. Then everything includes itself in power, power into will, will into appetite, and appetite a universal wolf so doubly seconded with will and power must make perforce a universal prey and last eat up himself. It was because they were afraid of anarchy, and indeed had very good reason to be so. It was because of this that people turned to the central power which presented the very essence of order, the national monarchy. Kings had already reduced the Holy Roman Emperor, who was their nominal lord, to a shadow. Now they turned against the power of their nominal subordinates, the feudal lords. The struggle between the central authority of the crown and the disruptive, decentralized forces of feudalism was going to end at last in the crown's triumph. and the internal unity imposed by the king was then going to prepare the way for external expansion. France was first in the field. Jeanne d'Arc, Joan of Arc, was the inspirer and the patron saint of this outburst of French patriotism produced by the misery and the humiliation of the Hundred Years' War. The daughter of a well-to-do peasant family, Joan believed she heard voices from angels and God who told her to rally her fellow French and drive out the English. Her martyrdom in 1431 at the hands of an ecclesiastical tribunal in English-controlled Rouen made her an even more powerful symbol of French resistance. By the second half of the 15th century, the war with England was over, feudal divisions were being mastered, and the foundations were laid for a national army and a national system of finance. It was then up to Louis XI 
in the second half of the 15th century to consolidate the monarchy as the core of a centralized state. After Louis XI and after his successor, Louis XII, the remnants of feudal independence were crushed and France began to expand at the cost of weaker neighbors. Province after province was incorporated into the French monarchy and before the end of the 15th century, the strength of the new form nation was going to push across the Alps and into Italy. Meanwhile, other states were following the French example. Ferdinand of Aragon married Isabel of Castille, drove the Moors out of Andalusia and founded the modern kingdom of Spain. Before long, Spain would also be pushing outside her borders over the Atlantic into America and over the Mediterranean to challenge the French in Italy. In England, after 1495, Henry VII was going to bring peace and order to the country, while on the other side of Europe, a series of marriages was creating another power. Maximilian of Austria married the heiress of Burgundy in the 15th century and united the Netherlands with Austria. His son, the Archduke Philip, married the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabel of Spain, and their two sons were Charles V, Emperor of the Spanish Empire, and Ferdinand I, who married the daughter of the King of Hungary and Bohemia, and founded the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. A lot of family details that probably bore you but that set the basis, the structure of European politics for the next few hundred years. And so as the 15th century turned to the 16th, the political system of Europe was roughly sketched out, although the boundaries of the rival kingdoms were still undetermined and there remained minor principalities and powers, especially in Germany and Italy, which offered an easy prey to their ambitious neighbors. In Germany, the king was also emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, which extended over hundreds of independent principalities and duchies. So he could only attain his office by agreeing not to enforce his authority, and the empire, in effect, was the tomb of German national unity. The unity of Italy, meanwhile, was prohibited not only by the rival ambitions of its cities and princes, but also by the position of the popes. This is Leo X, who became pope in 1513. Leo and his successors could not tolerate a secular rival in the peninsula. And although the papacy was never strong enough, or durable enough to unite Italy itself. It was always influential enough to keep anyone else from doing it, even if that meant calling in outsiders to help. And so Italy, like Germany, was ruled out of the national race and had to wait 300 years for the national consolidation which its rivals achieved by the 16th century. Now this period was also a time of more contact between states as political and territorial definition grew. And this increased contact in turn led to the development of new political forms to handle it. Squatters isolated on a large plain have little need for organized communication, but when they stake out their claims right up to their neighbor's property, they see each other more often, they watch each other more closely, they tend to fight. And that's what happened with the national states. Before the era of national expansion, 
diplomatic relations had been rare and spasmodic, and ambassadors were only dispatched on special occasions. But during the 15th and the 16th centuries, ambassadors became regular and resident. These two French ambassadors were painted in 1533, and while the modern diplomatic system was growing out of the necessity of countries busy watching each other, modern international law was growing out of the need to adjust the increasing number of international disputes. And out of the calculations, based on each state's jealousy of the other's growth, the idea of the balance of power grew as well. There were other changes. As the area over which the monarch ruled increased, his authority within his own dominions also increased. This is Louis XII, going off to assert his authority, actually not in France, but in Italy. Every extension of the king's sway intensified his dignity and lifted him higher above his subjects. Local liberties and feudal rights which checked a Duke of Brittany or a King of Aragon were much less effective against a King of France, like Francis I, or a king of Spain, who had more soldiers, higher revenues, and better credit. Feudal and local powers fought a long holding action against the crown for hundreds of years, but the tendency was against them once the king became the symbol of national unity and the center of national aspirations. And this monarch gained as much from the growth of the new ideas as he did from the decay of the old. The Renaissance, which we shall discuss in detail next time, the revived study of Roman civil law, eventually the Reformation, all of these would contribute to the growth of royal power. Even scholars who worked with their pens and who had to live on pensions contributed to it. Pensions, after all, can be more easily got from princes than from parliaments because parliaments don't regard purely intellectual achievements as a service to the state. And so the scholars looked to the king and the king got his reward in the praise he received from the world of letters. Helped by new benefactors, scholars and artists had the means to study the mythology, literature and art of the Romans and from there to rediscover the Romans' political organization and their laws, all of which had a significant effect on European thinking. Just as the classical Latin of ancient Rome seemed superior to medieval Latin, dismissed as dog Latin, so Roman imperial law seemed superior to the barbarousness of European common law and feudal custom. As scholars rediscovered Roman law, its study and application spread outward from the Italian universities, first into the lands of the Holy Roman Empire, whose emperors regarded themselves as the successors of Imperial Rome, and then into the rest of Europe. So by the 15th century, the maxims of Roman law were everywhere, and our civil laws are all marked by it. Nothing could have suited the new kings better because the old common law and feudal custom were based on local interests and constituted checks on any central power. The maxim of the Roman law, however, was that the will of the king was law. And this was a maxim that could be quoted against lords or popes or parliaments. There was also the Roman tradition of deifying emperors, 
And by the 16th century, some European courtiers were almost inclined to pay similar honors to their kings. To understand their attitude, you have to remember the misrule of the previous age, the decline and failure of the previous system, and the strength of popular demand for a firm, masterful hand at the wheel. There is a modern myth that people have always tended towards democracy, constitutions, electoral rights. But in truth, love of freedom has never been the predominant note of popular politics. At most times, popular demand has been for a strong government. The government of the kings was never good, but it seemed better at least for a while than the anarchy that preceded it. Authoritarian stability was better than authoritarian anarchy. The violence of an organized state was preferred to the blinder violence of a disorganized feudalism. And in the 14th century, any state that could afford it had means of violence more efficient and more expensive than ever before. Strong government and capital-intensive warfare traditionally go together. That's because the power that controls the weapons can enforce its will. And the first thing it enforces is taxation to pay for more weapons. Taxation, in turn, reinforces the central authority and its bureaucracy and makes it more efficient. So the better the weapons and the military that use them, the greater the central authority's capacity to tax and control, and the stronger its growth at the expense of its subjects and of other lesser powers. The 1300s and the 1400s saw the appearance of weapons that would affect history down to our own day. Guns and gunpowder. Centuries before, the Byzantines had used Greek fire. Fireballs that helped them beat off the Slavs and the Arabs. These fireballs were shot from catapults but increasingly from tubes as well. So when the idea of guns with metal tubes reached Europe from India and China in the 13th century, there were European weapon makers who could copy them. Cannon and cannonballs made of iron or stone were useful against walls, ships, and troops in close formation. Turkish cannon battered down the walls of Constantinople in 1453. French cannon helped drive out the English at the end of the Hundred Years' War. And there were also handguns. An English general was killed by a handgun in the last battle of the Hundred Years' War in 1452. By the 1500s, the arquebus, the musket, the rifle came into their own and became the core weapon of modern infantry, also the key to European power beyond Europe. It would be handguns that won much of America for Spain and the East Indies for Spaniards, Portuguese, English and Dutch in Mexico, the guns of the Spanish were thought to produce lightning. It would be difficult for any man to stand up against controlled lightning. And so the future lay with Europe's more modern armies, equipped with artillery, like the French armies that conquered Italy after the 1490s, and equipped with handguns that won America for the Spaniards, and gave the Spanish infantry a superiority that dominated Europe into the 17th century. After all, not everybody could build a gun. You needed arsenals and expensive equipment. By the 16th century, 
Spain and other states were spending two-thirds of their revenue on weapons. Naturally, countries with plenty of iron ore and a superior metallurgy had a great advantage, and that meant Central Europe, France, and in due course, the Swedes. The new weapons also meant that cities and feudal lords were no longer safe behind their walls. Modern warfare based on guns and gunpowder dispensed once and for all with castles, with knights in armor, and also with a culture of chivalry and the culture of independent cities. It opened the age of the modern state, interested in order, in taxes, and in strong, ever stronger institutions. So war and government and the world in general have all been transformed by gunpowder. Those of you who don't like the idea of a strong interventionist state will deplore this development and I really see the point. But you have to remember the robber baron and the general disorder that went before. The days of Romeo and Juliet may seem romantic, but they were also days of gang warfare and terror and bloodshed. A lot of English and French and Italians were glad to see noble knights replaced by the king's peace, fragile as it was and as it still is. Next time, the Renaissance. Until then. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.